Hi, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to have the chance to talk to you today about a topic that is right at the very forefront of technology development today. That topic is humanoid robotics. Let me see if I can master the technology. Yes, I can. Okay, so by way of brief introduction, I'm from a company called Engineered Arts. I've put up here a range of our products. These are all real robots, if you're wondering, that we've built over about the last five, six years, something like that. And they're all out with customers in the wild now. That's actually about all that I want to say about Engineered Arts products specifically today, because what I want to talk about in this session is much more general about humanoid robotics. So we've got the question up here, why invest $100 million in humanoid robots? And I'm going to try and answer that from a couple of different perspectives. First, I want to examine the fascination that you already have with humanoid robotics and the fascination that I have with humanoid robotics, okay? Because that's going to establish where there is a market for it. Why are you fascinated? What is it in humanoid robotics that you want to see? Okay, and then secondly, I'm going to look at what use cases do we need to develop for to make that happen? Okay, so first I want to ask you a question. I put up here a picture of four different robots. These are all real robots made by four different companies, four designers. Um, the question I want you to think about is, is this as good as it gets? Is this the future that you want to see? When you think about humanoid robotics, does this meet your requirements? For me, the answer is no. And I think the same is going to be true for a lot of you. There's something missing. There's something that's not quite meeting the vision that you have in your mind. What is that? That's a bit more of a difficult question to answer. What's missing? And to try and answer that, I want to have a little look through some history. So obviously we are, we're here at Codex and I couldn't let the moment pass without a reference to Da Vinci. Um, what you see up on the screen now, this is a thing called the Mechanical Knight. Da Vinci uh, drew the designs for this. It's dated approximately to 1495. All I want you to take away from that is a single data point of many that we could look at if we had time to show you the pedigree of the fascination that humanity has with mechanical humanoids, with humanoid robots, okay? Now, when I say history, actually, I don't want to talk about history hundreds of years ago. I want to talk about something that's much more familiar to you. I'm talking about cinema history, right? Movie history. What I put on the screen here are a bunch of movies, TV shows. I'm sure you're familiar with some, most, maybe all of them. Why have I put these up here? They're a very useful exercise, certainly for someone who's a technologist, because they allow you to step back from the technology, right? You can step back from the practical considerations of what's possible, what's not possible, because what these are are explorations of pure imagination, right? These are people exploring without any limits what they want to see when they think about humanoid robotics. And this is, this is pushing towards what you probably have as your image in your mind of what humanoid robots should be. So then we come to the thought, well, if we can understand what lies behind these films, right? What's the common theme that drives these films, that what, what people want to see? Then we can begin to answer the question of what was missing from those robots that we were looking at. And I think there's actually a very simple way to, to look at this. If you take the idea of humanoid robot, okay? And you separate those two words. So you think about humanness and robotness. And now you think what you see in any of these films here. None of these films really focus on robotics, right? None of them are particularly concerned with the mechanics and what a robot can physically do. What they're concerned with is the human side of it, okay? They're concerned with the intelligence of the robot, the emotions. How do you communicate, connect, interact with humanoid robots, right? Those are the topics that actually fascinate people. And that's why we have an interest. It's a little bit, you could call it um, maybe Vanity, maybe curiosity, it depends how you think about these things. But it's a little bit of a way of humanity to hold up a mirror to itself. Say, what is human? What is robot, right? How close can we get the one to the other? Or, or, or what, what is the fundamental thing that separates them? And it's exploring those ideas that all of these films come together with. So that was what was missing in the last slide. All of those robots, perfectly good robots in and of themselves, but they don't come close enough to the human form factor to the human behavior, okay? They can't make gestures and expressions that are detailed enough to start allowing us to explore the answers to these questions that these filmmakers have, have put in front of us, okay? So there's your fascination, right? A fundamental human fascination with ourselves and what, what we can rebuild of ourselves. 
Now the question is, how do we, how do we build products to explore that? What are the actual use cases? So we need to continue this, this theme on separation between human and robot, okay? And applications where the humanness is emphasized and the robotness is secondary is where we're gonna hit what we've already established is the fascination. I want you to consider what I'm gonna put before you as a, as a bad example of a humanoid robot, okay? So you see here, um, the logic is very obvious and it's very simple. This guy, he doesn't wanna push his wheelbarrow full of dirt, so he imagines a humanoid robot doing the same thing. This is a very bad application for a humanoid robot because it's not using any of the humanity aspect. There is no point in that robot being a human shape, okay? It could be any other shape. You could put a motor in the wheel of that wheelbarrow and some little casters on the back, and it would do the job just fine, and it would do it cheaper, and it would do it more reliably. The other kind of prism, the other lens that you can look at this through, a good application for a humanoid robot is one where the value of the task significantly outweighs, and is heavier than, the technical difficulty of achieving that task, okay? And the robot with the wheelbarrow is exactly, the robot with the wheelbarrow is this seesaw, okay? It's an enormously technically difficult problem to solve. You cannot go and buy this robot from anyone in the world today. Nobody can build it, right? What we need are applications that are fundamentally important for, from our fascination of humanoid robotics, but that are within our technical grasp to reach. I put up here some example applications that I wanna walk through with you. Um, the first thing I want you to notice about all of these potential applications, they're all about humans interacting with robots. They're all about human experience, right? None of these is anything about the mechanical tasks that we try to make the robot do. So let's, let's consider briefly um, the, the first three of these. So we've got um, perhaps a tour guide in a museum. We've got, uh, this could be a, a check-in desk at an airport, a hotel. It could be a reception desk in your company. And we've got um, an entertainment venue here. It's a casino, a roulette table. What, what are we doing in this case? What are we doing with the humanoid robots? Well, fundamentally, what we're doing is we're recognizing that all these people having these experiences have got this, this vision, right, in their mind. And we are then building the vision that they're already looking for, okay? There's another aspect to it, which is that most of these people wouldn't believe that we can build these robots. There's a, a great quote, quote from... Um, Arthur C. Clarke, and he says something like, um, any technology that's sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And that's what we're doing here, is we're, we're building technology that these people absolutely desperately want to see, but don't really believe that we can achieve. And doing that, we can deliver a magical experience, okay? And so you can really level up any of these kind of applications here. I don't want to talk for any longer about that because I, I want to talk a little bit about the last picture there, because this is something which I think is, is even more important. This is where we start going on to the next, the next step. So what we're looking at here, this could be a situation in a care home, it could be in someone's private home, okay? We're still talking about an application where the physical capabilities of the robot are not super important, okay? It's the interaction with the human beings. I want you to start to think about um, certain elements where we currently don't make the best use of our technology. So think about um, degenerative type illnesses, degenerative mental illnesses. We could be talking about dementia, we could be talking about Alzheimer's, something like that. Now we have fantastic technologies, right? Everyone in this room has a smartphone in their pocket, okay? And these are great for things like communication. They're great for things like reminders. They're great for things like organizing medical appointments, even mundane things like organizing your bank accounts, right? These technologies do not translate through to some of the people that could benefit most, right? Some of the people who are perhaps vulnerable, who are perhaps starting to suffer from unfortunate medical conditions. And that's an engineering problem. It's a problem of interface, right? We've built the, this technology with an interface, which we're all completely second nature with, right? It's, it's touch screens, it's separate apps for things, it's pinch to zoom and all these kind of things. And we've been fortunate that that technology came to us when we were young enough that we could get hold of it and, and it could become second nature. But there's a, a large group of people who that isn't the case. And anyone who's ever tried to teach maybe a parent or a grandparent to use one of these devices, they, they, they know that. What if we could solve that interface problem, right? What if we could completely get rid of the interface and the only interface you need is the one that every single person already has. If you can talk to another person, you can already use a humanoid robot, as long as it's made well enough, as long as it's made faithful enough to the human form factor, 
you can already use that. And that means all those other technology benefits that we, that we actually have essentially what's a computer, a smartphone, or a robot, you can start to bring those technologies to other people. There's, there's another aspect, in fact, there's a lot of aspects that you can, you can look at in this. Supposing that we continue with, with, with this care theme, and someone's living with a humanoid robot, which is giving them support and which they learn to rely on. And over the course of their illness, it eventually progresses to a point where now they, they need increased support, right? So they have to move perhaps into a more dedicated care facility. That could be extremely disruptive for people, right? They leave their own home, they're around a bunch of complete strangers. Now suppose that they've been living with this robot for six months, for 12 months, for 18 months, right? It's become something that's familiar to them, that they can rely on, that can actually help them keep in touch with their family and all these kinds of things, gives them some level of independence. And now you can take that with them as they, as they go on that journey, as they go into other facilities, increase care. You can actually start to unlock a huge um, amount of social benefit from these robots, still without having to solve ridiculously difficult technical challenges of, of walking and of interacting with the physical world. So there's huge potential benefit there as well. So I'm gonna start wrapping up now. We started with the question, of why should you invest $100 million in a human robot or whatever amount of money you've got? And I want to emphasize for you how fantastically um, prophetic science fiction has been at predicting technologies that are going to become ubiquitous. Think about the flat screen television, okay? Now, this occurred first in science fiction, or at least early. Flash Gordon's trip to Mars, 1938. Not only did they have giant um, flat screens on the wall, they were using them for video conferencing, right? This is in the days about two years after the very first CRT screen television, which was about this big a screen and about this big of a box, okay? They were already imagined. How many of those do you have in your house? Five, 10, I don't know how big your house is, but lots. What about this guy, Captain Cook? 1966, he had his flip up communicator. In 50 years, we've gone from that being a science fiction vision to being old technology, right? You put one of those out of your pocket now, you're a museum piece. I think that's incredible. You might or might not be so familiar, this is actually an American character, very well-known cartoon in America, Dick Tracy. 1946 first appeared this very iconic image of him talking into his two-way wrist communicator. I bet a lot of people in this room have one of those on their wrist right now. And we've already seen the science fiction background, right? The films, the TV shows by humanoid robotics. Yeah? This example I pick here, this is from the days just before we actually had sound. This is a black and white silent movie made in Germany in 1927. One of the first appearances of humanoid robots on the screen. Now, are you really saying that you think that this, this technology with our inherent fascination and with the huge benefits that it can bring to us is not going to turn into a technology we actually see in the world. So I want to sort of leave you with a question, I guess. I, I started with the question of why should you invest $100 million in humanoid robots? Well, I'm gonna leave you with the question and say, can you afford not to be invested in them? It's been a pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you very much.